good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's panel discussion for the Yale program in the history of the book, a collaboration of the Yale University English Department and the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library. I'm Catherine James, one of the program's conveners and the curator for early modern books and manuscripts at the Beinecke. And my co-organizers are David Caston, George M. Bodman, Professor of English, Ben Card, a third year graduate student in the English Department, and Colton Valentine, a second year graduate student in English. This year's book history program focuses on the present project, which presence project, which invites six scholars to think about the meanings of presence in relation to the, to the material text. What does it mean to be present in the archive, to be present with the material text, to survive or bear witness? These questions have always been at the core of the humanities as, as a scholarly and critical project. And the presence project represents an invitation to consider them again now in our current historical and political context. Our participants will each write an essay to be published in a chapbook and will create a process archive of that essay to be housed in the Beinecke Library collections for future readers to encounter their thoughts on the present moment. Last week, we met with Bonnie Mack and Dennis Duncan, Jill Partington and Adam Smythe of 39 Step Press. And today I have the privilege of introducing our participants, Tia Blassingame and Jesse Meyer. Let me offer a brief introduction of our speakers before we turn to discussion with them. Tia Blassingame is an assistant professor of art at Scripps College. She's a book artist and printmaker and the proprietor of Primrose Press. Exhibited and collected at institutions across the country, Tia's work draws on letterpress, typography, printmaking, book arts, and poetry to engage with race and history and the ways in which, to quote her words, racism has warped our perception and has melted into our vocabulary, social structure, and our urban landscape. She is also the founder in 2019 of the book print artist Scholar of Color Collective with its mission of bringing book history and print culture scholars into conversation with BIPOC book print artists. Our second participant is Jesse Meyer, one of very few parchment makers in practice in the world. Jesse is the founder and owner of Pergamina, part of the Meyer family tannery, which draws on a family history in the tanning and leather industry, which extends back some 350 years. Jesse's work has been focused on the excavation of historic and often lost parchment making traditions, bringing these to life through his work in Pergamina. He is a widely consulted expert on parchment and parchment making, teaching students and scholars around the world about parchment. I'm grateful that our participants accepted the invitation to participate in this project and very happy to be here today together for this discussion. We'll begin with a series of three questions and then open the discussion to the panel and the audience. So if you have questions over the course of the discussion, I hope you'll place these in the Q&A so that we can engage with them in discussion at the end. So to start um, with our first question, Tia, um, I wondered if you could begin by responding um, to the overall question of just what has guided, what has begun to guide your thinking um, as you've started to work and approached your essay and archive and thinking about the project. Sure. Um, so I guess I start at um, having been invited um, to the project, um, you know, and I was a bit surprised, but then not surprised, um, thinking about the presence, presence of um, the institution of Yale um, in the city of New Haven, which is where I'm from and um, am presently um, residing during the pandemic, um, ways that it supports but doesn't support as much as maybe it could, um, the life and residence of the city, um, its presence in my own life. Um, and I would say uh, that would be a, a, a tenuous relationship to, to be kind. Um, uh, thinking about um, exploitation in terms of um, black scholarship, presence, uh, omission, erasure, um, thinking of the presence of um, the Beinecke Library, um, again, in my own life through my father, um, John Blassingen, um, you know, his um, involvement in um, the uh, Richard Wright papers um, being at the Beinecke and that he um, actually met with um, his uh, widow. Um, my understanding was that at that time, he was about the only per 
person that she was willing to meet with. Um, I think about, um, again, the library in my life. Um, it's actually the place that we had the repass um, after his funeral service. Um, and then in starting the project, kind of thinking about how do you start a project during a pandemic, right? Um, you know, it's so kind of um, fracturing, um, sort of disrupting of, um, you know, life of, you know, I think of like a pre art practice, um, just being, um, and really starting to um, think related to the pandemic um, and sort of coming out of the pandemic, hopefully, fingers crossed, I think with all of us, um, but kind of looking over the last year or so, uh, being approached last year, kind of um, in the midst of the pandemic, um, but also um, protests and um, sort of recognition of the epidemic of um, you know, racial um, inequality, violence, police brutality. Um, and you know, those are things that I think to some extent are, are very much part and parcel of my work. So it didn't seem surprising that that would be coming into play in my thinking. Um, but I think very much I'm thinking about futures, specifically black futures, as we think about um, white supremacy and attempting to dismantle that. Um, but really this moment where you start to think about kind of like the after times after the pandemic, um, what are we willing, you know, I think there's a lot of talk like the new normal or norm going back to normal. Um, and I think this is an interesting time to think about um, imagining what we want that future to be. Um, and, you know, who knows how much longer we're going to be in the pandemic and, and, um, and how that and, and, and other things that might occur. Um, so I'm very much thinking about Black futures. Um, and so for um, this project, I mean, at this moment in time right now, um, you know, watching um, the um, trial of um, Chauvin, um, which of course is very upsetting, um, but I think that's part of um, this moment and not wanting to sort of go back um, and trying to envision what the future could be. Um, and so with this project, um, again, thinking about presence, um, you know, sort of what that term means, um, you know, presence of mind, presence, even as like a police presence, right? Um, and then thinking of that sort of um, opposite, so of um, absence, um, maybe omission, erasure, um, and trying to sort of juggle those, you know, and try to um, find a place I think for me, this project was very challenging, um, partly because it was so open-ended um, and it was surprising to me that that was a challenge because that's never been a challenge for me before. Um, but so it took me a while to get into the project, I would say. Um, right now I'm thinking a lot about metadata, um, particularly sort of opening it up so that the metadata, is it thinking about metadata for something that may exist, may not exist? The metadata may actually not be correct. Um, I think a, um, like an example is um, a lot of times um, Scripps, Scripps College Press um, books that have been created kind of um, during my time. Um, technically, they're not books by me. Um, they're books by a certain group of students or an individual student. Um, but typically when they're listed in a library catalog, they're attributed to me as the author. Um, and that is very much incorrect. Um, and so um, moving from that to really shifting the relationship between the metadata and the actual item that it's referring to um, and looking for ways that they may be in conflict um, that item may not exist. Um, that's sort of right now, sort of the thinking um, of the work. Um, also still trying to grapple with um, the archive versus the essay. And I think, I, I don't know if somewhere in that relationship that might be um, 
the essay being the metadata related to the archive or the archive itself is the metadata. I'm not, I'm not clear yet. Um, and I think right now still being a bit open is pretty, I think, typical of, of my process. That that's wonderful. Thank you. And and that um raises so many things that I know we'll want to come back to in the discussion later on. Sure. Um Jesse, do you want to um to offer your answer to the question of how you've started approaching the essay in the archive? Um well uh thank you. Thank you, Tia, for going first because that helps give me a little a little direction. Um but uh yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fishing in waters I've never fished before. So I'm kind of casting my net wide and um, I'm not sure what I'm, I'm going to pull up. You know, presence is a very broad term. So I have, um, you know, I've, uh, I've tried to take that in many directions. Um, I actually had a, a bit of a, a list here if I can find it. And if the rest of my family would stop texting me and it keeps showing up on my computer, which is really annoying. Um, but uh, so, all right. So, uh, right. Some of the things that I've, that I've thought about, I just, you know, sort of stream of consciousness notes that I've put down, but um, you know, every, everything that I, everything that I look at, um, I don't know if polymath is the right term because I wouldn't say that I'm good enough to be considered a polymath, but lots of different things that I'm interested in. And so whatever, whatever fields I happen to be interested in, I find the occasional, um, you know, analog to this, this sort of stuff. So, you know, just reading, reading various things. Um, I happened to watch a, a Nova special a while ago and, um, you know, I think it was about how writing changed the world, which obviously has a little bit to do with what, what with what we're doing here. And um, and I, I just remember really enjoying it, but also being really frustrated because, um, you know, there's the, this accumulated body of knowledge that uh, that a lot of people have to work with, and I feel like I am trying to accumulate that body of knowledge. Um, so presence presence of knowledge, perhaps. Um, presence of mastery, and I feel like I'm still, still far from that in many ways. Um, and uh, yeah, the the as I was saying to you, Catherine, before we we got on, you know, I'm we're very busy here at the moment, and uh, um, you know, so I'm juggling a lot of things. So it it always makes me feel like I'm being spread a bit too thin. So I would really enjoy the luxury of presence and focus, although I've I've I don't know if I would know what to do with it if I had it. This is just always the way I've operated. So, but it means that I sort of move slowly working on things in several directions at once. But uh, yeah, presence and focus. So presence in my work, I suppose. Um, and, you know, maybe a little bit of a, you know, there's the, the ADHD of the, the stuff that I happen to be going through all the time and presence of, um, you know, presence of the work, presence of uh, the balance of getting this stuff done. Um, you know, the interesting projects that people approach us with and how I try to devote what, what, what I can to those, um, those projects, whether it be parchment related or, you know, more science related. I mean, I, I may have said this before, but uh, I, I went into, I mean, I, I have an, an arts background and I went into an arts background because I was really fearful of of the sciences and anything that involved the, the written word and, and the research that went into that. Um, and here I find myself doing an awful lot more of that than I ever thought that I would, which in some ways is interesting. It's like a back door to, to that, um, you know, to all of that fascinating research. But, uh, but then when it comes time to, uh, you know, catalog it and archive it, as you suggest, and write it down, um, that's a bit terrifying, <laughs> but such as it is, I, I think I, you know, I, when you came to me with this um, invitation, um, you know, I was very humbled um, and, uh, you know, also a bit, a bit intimidated, but I thought, well, the only way that I'm ever going to sort of advance myself in any of these directions is to, 
you know, to just put my, put my stake in the ground and, you know, go further from there. So a lot of this, a lot of this research that I'm trying to gather for you for this project, um, you know, is, is me trying to push myself um, to, to learn more. So presence of mastery, um, the presence of parchment, you know, for, forgive me, I'm just sort of going over my notes as we're talking here, but uh, yeah, the presence of the material in the modern world and how it's applied, you know, whether it be in fields of scientific study or, or art or design or, um, you know, just uh, things like that. But uh, also, I guess the fields of study that this brings me into the presence of, maybe to sort of flip that on its head a little bit, um, you know, and some of the things I listed that, you know, just some of the people that have sort of, I've crossed paths with in working in this, with this material in this field is, you know, fashion. I'm just going to list some things. Fashion, nutritional products, sustainability, craft, ergonomics, uh, medieval studies, obviously, biocode ecology, design, art, calligraphy, um, animal husbandry, anthropology, um, the idea of mastery, um, literature, uh, forensics. So those are just some of the things that I can sort of work with <laughs> to, um, you know, to sort of build on. But um, yeah, and I guess lastly, this is something that I've been thinking of recently. Um, we, you know, as you know, we've been, our family's been doing this for a long time and somebody recently, like a, a long lost cousin, second cousin sent me a bunch of uh, photographs that, uh, of my grandfather and his brother and, uh, and my great grandfather, um, who ran the tannery back, you know, back during world war two. And, um, so I found, you know, I got these photographs, showed my father and he proceeded to tell me some very interesting stories about most of the characters in this. Um, in this picture, which are pretty fascinating. Um, you know, so I guess there's the presence of, of the family as well. And being that it's so closely linked to what our business is. And, uh, you know, there's, I always wrestle with this, you know, if I'm going to try to be or run a, a business and have it be profitable, I should use whatever tools I have at my disposal, such as you know, the, the presence of this history and the story and try to help that when, when building a brand, you know, to, to go into the sort of naked economics of, of what, what I'm doing here. And um, so that has sort of always, I've had to balance that with, you know, I, I don't want to over exploit the presence of my family and the history, um, but knowing that it is something that a lot of people seem to gravitate towards and find very interesting. So it's a balance of trying to, to tell that story, but also to make sure that our products speak for themselves, you know, and that we have the knowledge and the material that uh, in the end is, is gonna be here after we're gone. So my hope is that that will, that will do as much as the family story in helping to sort of perpetuate what we're doing. Hope that wasn't too rambling. No, no, not at all. And, and it's so interesting that you both um, pick up on this idea of the, the tension almost inherent in, in the project and these I, the sense of the presence, I think, brings this sense of incompleteness or omission or absence. Um, and also the idea of inheritance that we're kind of present here is the sometimes partial, like um, the partial um, partially present representation of a past history of some kind, however one wants to rate that. Um, okay, um, so so in moving on to um, our next question, and T, I don't know if you mind going first again, um, um, or actually, Jesse, I think you were listed to go first a second, so let's stick to that. Um, um, so um, I wondered if you could, I think one of the difficulties with a project like this is the long, um, initial phase of thinking about it and trying to figure out which direction um, one might be going in. And then there's a moment when you have to start to think about 
moving to a final structure, about bringing it to completion. And so, Jesse, I wondered if, and, and I know both of you, um, all the participants are, are really still in, very much in the initial stages of this, um, but I wondered if you could um, just talk a bit, Jesse, about how you go about um, bringing that really broad, um, that broad early um, approach to a project to a more final um, phase in, in your work, either with this or just generally? Uh, let's see. Um, I was trying to consider as far as how this might be written you know, I mean, just just trying to think of like the actual structure of of uh, of an essay. You know, what I would cover. I mean, I've seen some very interesting examples. Yours, yours among them, Catherine. Your your essay about your visit here and and uh, it, your your father, um, which I thought was very very eye opening, very interesting, and sort of you know, it sort of framed it in a, in a way that I hadn't really thought of before. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, it's like, I mean, I suppose what what uh, has put me in, in touch with with uh, your field in the first place was the, the material that we're making here and the process and how it relates, you know, the sort of anthropological approach of, of what I'm doing and how it relates to to the book and medieval studies and 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 history. Um, so I was thinking of it as well. Yeah, I mean, there, you, you could just write a, a how-to. I mean, people have asked me for a long time, um, you should really write down what you're doing. Um, and uh, I, I have yet to find the time to do that. So I feel like, well, this is an opportunity to try to sort of crystallize a lot of this stuff. But I feel like I also don't want this to be just a plain sort of a, you know, how-to or recipe book. Um, so I'm trying to balance that with, you know, well, is this... A look into the sort of inner monologue of what goes through my head from from day to day and whether that would be of something of, of any interest <laughs> to people to you know to to want to hear um but you know i guess that's you know to go back to the to the term presence it's like my presence in this process and however uh tortured or meandering or direct um, or immediate that process is, you know, it, it's still, it's still my presence in this process and how it gets from, from one point to another. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess that's, that's where I'm at right now is trying to figure out and, and I guess maybe I'll try to blend the two is um, I feel like it would be of use to everyone to have some information about like the process of what I'm doing here. Um, so, and I, I'm more than happy to share that, but keeping in mind that this is, it seems a bit more of an open-ended essay, um, you know, I may also put some personal thoughts in there too about um, how, how this material and how my, you know, this business has, you know, shaped me over time. Great, thank you. Um, and Tia, did you wanna um, also answer this? Sure, question? sure. Um, so typically I have, you know, my ideas come together relatively quickly. Um, and I'm realizing I think once the um, container arrives, then it will feel more, more real. Um, right now, ideas are still kind of pinging around and I, I don't have something physical kind of limiting me at this point. Um, so I think once the container arrives, then I think, I think my ideas around the, the physical archive, I mean, they're, they're already there, but sort of how to, how to translate that into um, something tangible. Um, I think that will come together pretty quickly. Um, I have been writing, um, and just kind of thinking of, of futures, um, you know, the idea of the essay, I've already kind of in my mind and in the writing accepted that um, I'm not really adhering to any rules around writing an essay. Um, at this point, I don't even have like 
I'm not even using spaces at this point. It's kind of um, free form, um, kind of challenging to read. Maybe you won't read it, maybe you do. Um, and just to sort of put it down, I think particularly trying to put down um, thoughts related to this moment in time um, that you know every day to some extent is different and um, the sort of feelings that I'm having may not exist or be relevant in a month or you know a few months you know who knows uh, I expect to wear a mask for a lot longer but who knows um, so um, you know I've just been trying to just write um, and um, thinking that that's the essay, I'm not sure, um, but I, I do feel like things will come together once that container comes together. But typically um, with a project like this, my ideas gel pretty quickly. Um, you know, I start thinking about um, sort of the relationship that the viewer reader is going to have with that physical object and, and working to um, create a relationship that they're going to have and kind of a conversation that they're going to have. Um, and that's not quite there yet. That's uh, still kind of unclear. And I think to some extent, I'm trying to stay in this point of being unsure because I think about, um, you know, a reader, a viewer in right at this moment. And that same reader a year from now or 10 years from now after we're sort of beyond this point, right? Maybe someone who um, was alive during this point, um, someone who might not have experienced this moment, right? Um, they're gonna have a very different understanding of that uh, archive and of, of that essay. Um, so I'm sort of trying to pause in that. It sort of feels like, I mean, it's some subject matter that I wanna continue exploring so I'm trying to kind of sit with that and kind of um, develop my ideas around it. And I think that's why I'm pausing, I think for longer than I typically would. Um, and then also typically I have something within the project that's kind of just for me, no one really needs to know it. Um, it's typically um, trying to push myself, whether it's um, you know a technique or skill that I have been avoiding, I don't feel like I'm very good at it yet. And so I sort of bring that into the project or it might be a material that, um, you know, I'm not really feeling comfortable with and I'll bring that in. Um, and I'm not clear if that's gonna happen within this project. Um, I, I think it will, because why shouldn't it? Just, you know, I think we're always learning and expanding. Um, and so I could see that being part of this, but I, I, I don't have a clear sense of what that is. And again, that's, that's not typical. Usually that comes together very early on in the project, but I, I, I feel like it's, it, it's coming. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting in that I, I hear both of you picking up on the idea of the metadata or the container or the sort of what is being documented and those, um, those uh, sort of bounding concepts that help to, to move forward with something like this, particularly as it's so open-ended. And, and to your comment on the like the future or present readers also one that is interesting it hadn't hadn't occurred to me to think of the reader um, temporally who of course um, would be really different um, out out of covid um, so um, in our our third question comes back to this idea of the reader um, and and Tia I, I wonder if you could start with this and just and I I know um, both of you in your work must think about the recipient, but those recipients I think are, are um, you know, just Jesse from your list of the different um, relationships of parchment to various fields. Those are very different recipients as well. And Tia, in your work with students um, as, as an artist exhibiting, um, you're also speaking to very different um, readers who are, or, or an audience who is situated in very different contexts as well. And so Tia, I wondered if you could um, just speak to how you go about when you're in this process of actually working on something before it's done, how you go about um, imagining the particular reader that you might be speaking to if you're in fact speaking to somebody um, specific um, and um, just as you go about beginning to frame your project. Um, so I would say typically my 
um, principal um, sort of audience is um, African American, whether it's man, woman, child. Um, but that's sort of typically my principal audience because I think about um, creating the work for them, right? Um, and then, you know, they're sort of secondary readers. I, I think a lot about um, their reaction, um, whether it's to um, an aspect of tactility, sort of strangeness, um, understanding, not understanding, um, you know, how, how they're approaching the work. But I, I sort of increasingly, who I'm thinking of as readers is, is very broad. Um, but I think about sort of each type of reader, um, particularly in how they're gonna um, engage with the piece, but it's always around um, the conversation that they're gonna be in with that piece and the relationship that they're gonna develop with that piece. Um, <clears throat> so I think about um, like an example is um, my artist book, uh, You Are, right? Um, so it's sort of primary readers are um, black women, black girls, um, secondary white women, white girls. And then from that, that kind of everyone else, right? Um, but I always kind of have um, a, a target, but also understanding that, um, you know, a piece like this, the archive is going to be in a space that maybe isn't um, as accessible and approachable um, for a lot of different types of audiences um, and sort of what that means. So particularly with this, thinking about, um, you know, Black um, students and community at Yale that, that would have um, access and kind of entree to this space and understanding that, that they have that access to the space. Um, but it really um, is kind of everyone, um, but thinking in sort of different groupings. Um, and, you know, I think, I think a lot about that relationship and trying to, and what I want that relationship to be. Um, a lot of times that um, relationship involves a physicality. Um, sometimes I um, will think a lot about um, that physical relationship, how um, that reader is physically moving um, and interacting with the piece. Um, you know, so a piece like, um, Harvest Holding and Trading um, artist book that is very much um, meant to have the reader moving in and out. Um, so they're physically having to kind of move in closer um, to um, basically gain access to um, some lines of text. They have to kind of move away from that proximity to the page just to turn the page, right? Um, but so that's something I'm, I'm, I think a lot about, um, and I, I expect to, to consider that as well. Again, I think um, right now, because this project is so open-ended, it really is the container that kind of gives me one variable that isn't, you know, all, sort of all encompassing and, and open. And I think once I can spend some time with that container, that'll kind of um, give me some indicators about how I would like that reader to, to physically engage with the archive. Um, thinking about the reader for the essay, that's still unclear um, because I am trying to kind of imagine this, this future, you know, this future that might have, um, may not um, even respect our sort of um, rules around grammar or the page or um, typography or kind of anything. Um, so I think that's kind of, um, those are the considerations that I have ar around the, the reader. It's definitely that physical engagement and developing some kind of relationship with, with the piece. And, and that was an issue, that was a question that came up in our discussion last week as well of the, um, the, the container as a kind of framing device for, for the um, archive in, in the long run. And then also the relationship of the essay, the chapbook to it for readers in, in the reading room or elsewhere. Um, so Jesse, um, could you also speak to this, the, the like how you imagine um, 
the particular reader for either the essay in this project or for your work more generally? Um, and how you, if you have a particular reader, how you sort of toggle between um, the different imaginings that you must have in mind for um, who that is as you go through different projects? Um, well, I guess I could start with the term reader. Reader might, I, I might look at that with a little bit of flexibility, um, you know, because uh, not being exactly, not being a book artist necessarily, but working with the material, um, you know, I guess a reader for me could be described as anyone who engages with it and uses it, and whether it's something that they'll appreciate and how they'll appreciate it. So how I engage with it is to, I mean, depending on how it's going to be used. I mean, this is, I mean, uh, Tia had mentioned about, um, um, I think earlier this, this talk or, or the first one that you gave, I remember you saying something about the tactile nature of what you, what you do and what you're making and how you're trying to make it approachable. And I think that in a, um, a very, a very basic way, what I'm making here is all about tactility. I mean, this material here, while it, it can be made beautiful, and that is certainly one of the, um, you know, characteristics of it. Um, one of the sort of initial reasons for this material's existence is to be written on. And so that tactility is very important for them. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's something that I always come back to, I mean, there's a list which I gave of many different um, people and how they interact with this material. But one thing that has been constant over the course of the last 20 plus years of me making it is when people up, look to use this material for either writing on or for uh, using in a binding or for printing on, um, for them, it's so important to be able to feel this stuff with their hands. So that, that tactility um, has a big place in, I guess, how I'm engaging with customer, uh, user slash reader. Um, and, uh, you know, and what's uh, two other things which just thought of, I remember a few years ago, somebody came came to me uh, from, from Stanford uh, not to name drop, but from Stanford, and they were saying what you're what what you're doing is interesting here, and this tactility is very important, and there is a way to you know what we're working on is trying to sort of digitally um, um, export that tactility um, to somebody who isn't in your presence. There's presence again, um, but. Uh, you know, the idea of being able to sort of use this material um, as a stand in over the over the uh, the distance of many miles. And uh, I thought that was a very interesting take on the material. Um, but uh, that was long before COVID came along. And now the idea of tactility and about getting anything in front of anyone uh, to be able to handle themselves also seems to be quite a challenge. Um, so, you know, and uh, I've already had several interactions with people who, um, you know, over, over Zoom calls or by computer, um, who were hoping that they would be able to be here in person. I mean, workshops, I don't know if one could consider that a reader, but uh, engaging with people who use this material, you know, they, they want to come here and be able to see this for themselves. Well, that's not possible at the moment. So it's me having to try to navigate that with, with uh, various people um, and try to, you know, sending a lot of samples back and forth, trying to gauge what just the right feel is. So, I mean, those might be practical concerns, but uh, you know, the idea of being able to engage with a reader um, or a, a user is, uh, it is a bit challenging right now. Um, and I'm hoping that if we can sort of keep our head down and emerge on the other side of this, um, you know, I, th I think we, we have a long list of people who are waiting to come here to be able to see this material for themselves. And, uh, 
I always find that that's the best way to engage with anyone is for them to be able to see this material for themselves. You can explain it all you want, but um, which I've done many times. But when those same people finally come here to see with their own eyes, um, you know, it's a completely different level of understanding. So. That, that's great, thank you. And, and so um, I hope uh, people will put questions in the Q and A um, and we'll just uh, bring them into the discussion. But I wanted to pick up on this point that I think both of you have touched on in different ways and that a, a lot of your work, Jesse, is situated in practice um, and just daily you know, practice of running your business and making parchment and working with materials. And Tia, in your own work with uh, letterpress that um, you know, I've, I've, you know, follow you avidly on Twitter and have seen, uh, you know, from scripts, just your work with students um, that you, you know, you're there in, in the studio and help working with them as they produce materials um, that are then, um, I assume, archived as well and are kind of part of the scripts uh, college press um, archive. And so one of the things that is a little odd about this project and probably I would imagine about your work generally is that um, from from the from my perspective, both of you in practice is adds to the work itself. It adds an, another dimension to the work. Um, but of course, Tia, as you as you pointed out, um, one of the strangenesses of this project and really of the archive is that it's it's in a, it sits always both here and in a kind of unknown future. And so we're speaking to readers who uh, we can't assume will ever um, actually it, uh, have engaged with that or have any means of engaging with that. And so how do you think about um, like your own presence and your work and having that like stripped from it uh, as it kind of goes out into the world and into the future? And, and how do you think about that? Is that something that matters to you or not? Um, and it, does it, is it something that you've thought about like in this project at all? So I can say, um, you know, it doesn't upset me that there's a separation or uh, maybe elimination of my presence because typically, um, you know, when I talk about um, my own projects, I, I, you know, I talk about, um, you know, the viewer reader being in conversation with developing, uh, developing a relationship with, not with me, but with that piece. Um, and that's always purposeful. Um, my assumption is that um, as I present um, as a black woman um, who's tall, who's overweight, you know, on and on and on, um, the conversation that I would have with that reader is very different. Are they going to uh, listen to a word I have to say, believe anything I have to say, argue over me, listen to, you know, you know what I mean? Um, so um, part of the sort of crafting of um, that relationship and that physical relationship um, with the piece is, um, you know, I'm kind of not, not there. I'm present, but I'm not present. You know, I've, I've spent the time to um, manipulate the reader into a specific type of relationship down to physically how they are going to interact with the piece, right? Um, but I'm, I'm present, but I'm not present. So ideally I'm not present in that um, you might give this work a chance. You might be present in the conversation um, very much in a way that uh, that's different from how you would be um, in a conversation with me. So the idea that I'm not present, that's perfect. That's great. I, I don't need to be present because my presence disrupts, um, you know, just because of how I present, um, I don't have presence. Actually, I don't, I really don't have the kind of agency that I have behind the scenes. So, so, so that to me is, is typical um, for my work and something I think about a lot, but it doesn't, um, it absolutely doesn't bother me that, that I'm not present. I, um, my feeling is that it's better because I think it would actually, um, then the, that viewer reader, um, is more open to 
um, that conversation and relationship that they're going to have with the piece. Yeah, and that that reminds me a bit of um, your comment earlier on metadata as well, which is also um, present in a way that is um, unwriting its own presence, I think, also. So, so Jesse, I don't know if you have thoughts to add on this about like your, your, how, how you envision your work or um, your sort of production without you being part of it. Um, all right, well, let's see. Um, first of all, this sort of overlaps with the challenge of running a business, which is the idea of when you have a single craftsperson doing something and that craftsperson is directly, you know, intimately engaged and involved in producing something you know, that's when you have full and total control over how something is made. Um, you know, the, the, the more of this you do, and the, the, <laughs> the, the more thin that you tend to, that you spread your spread yourself, uh, the less you are able to actually be present in your work. So it's very important for us, because it's all about producing something, you know, like a, a physical material um, to a high level of craftsmanship, it's, uh, you know, one of the challenges, and I've heard this, I've heard people say this in other businesses as well, is make sure that you're replaceable. So the idea of being able to sort of pass along your knowledge, um, you know, and that's been done, you know, that's done several ways, but, you know, the whole idea of like guild and apprenticeship, which has been around for a very long time. Um, but, uh, you know, more, um, more recently, the idea of making sure that you just have your standard operating procedures written down so that you can take yourself out of that, physically take yourself out of that process um, and know that it's being done to your level of satisfaction so that you can then focus on something else. So, um, so that's, that's challenging. Um, and especially if you're, uh, I, I don't know, I would be very interested to hear what other people would say about me in this regard, but whether I'm like a control freak or whether I'm just obsessive about, about certain things. And while I certainly enjoy making, making this material, um, you know, I know that I can probably spend way more time doing this than anyone else would and, and uh, still not be completely satisfied. So I'm, I'm sure that many people could say that same thing, but it's, you know, to what degree. Um, but right. It's, it's hard to sort of make sure that you sort of, remove yourself from that and uh, make sure, you know, at some point you have to trust that it's going to be done well and uh, to your level of, of um, you know, satisfaction. Um, and then the, I guess the second thing I would say is um, over, over time, the only thing that will remain of what we're doing here is the material that we produce. And I've heard, um, you know, my father has said this, I've, I've seen it written elsewhere, but uh, tanners in general, uh, they had a, you know, just sort of like a, a, a maxim that was, uh, you know, the material will speak for itself. You know, let, you know, I'm, I'm not going to spend time going out and selling this because uh, if, if this is good material, then people will come, come seek it out. So, um, you know, to a point, I'm hoping that I can make this and make it to a, a degree of, of uh, perfection, that it's the sort of thing that people will seek out. And, you know, like uh, whoever made the Paris Bibles or William Morris and the people who made uh, his, his books, I mean, that level of, of, um, of mastery that has made their material um, sought after and just you know, and I guess there's a little bit of pride in that is making sure that you know that you make something and make it well enough so that it will stand the test of time. I don't know if that yeah. entirely answers. Yeah. No, that's, that's really interesting. And it's so interesting to hear you both touching on this idea of like erasure as well. Um, and Tia, you, 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 know, you started um, your um, first um, response by talking about um, erasure mm -hmm. and absence. Um, Politically around around race too, and so so that's it's it's funny to think of um, the archival survival that this project might have um, as in what ways it might be able to speak for itself um, through the metadata through the you know through the situation in the reading room to which readers under what circumstances and how does that um, mediate um, the uh, 
identity of something going forward. But we have a, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, and so I, I wanted to um, turn to these. I will start with uh, Ben Cards, um, my co-organizer, um, um, as he um, has um, commented on the um, pervasiveness in both of your responses of ideas of family legacy, inheritance, genealogy, and, and lineage. Um, and he wonders, um, at whatever level you actually are comfortable sharing or discussing, how you begin to think about your past, um, the, the past, your own families or otherwise, as you work to craft art objects, um, not only today, but um, through the Beinecke and Presence project into the future. And so how do you see this meeting point of like present and future generations fitting together uh, comfortably, uncomfortably, um, you know, um, in, in all of those different ways? So um, I don't know which of you might want to talk about this, about in inheritance. And obviously it's a point that I've thought about, um, you know, Jesse with, with parchment, just the idea of DNA and like forensic survival as well. So that's another aspect of this too, um, as well. And, and Tia, the, uh, like the material survival, the materials that make that is another form of um, inheritance. But I don't know if, if either of you have given much thought to, or would like to talk to this idea. I'll, I'll punt on that one. <laughs> um, I mean, it's something I think about a lot. Um, and I think it's, you know, I think we're in a moment in time to um, really consider that. I think we, you know, I think we're all really busy, um, but also um, kind of thinking a lot um, and, you know, about this moment in time. So there's always um, thinking about previous times, um, you know, contextion to, to family, um, the past. Um, so it, it's something I think about a lot um, in, my, in my own work um, and uh, will be sort of moving toward increasingly um, sort of past finishing a few projects. Um, I don't know that I necessarily have like a, a answer necessarily, um, but it is something that I, th I think about a lot. Um, and I think I, I can see why we both would be thinking about it um, just in terms of, um, you know, the library that we're working with, right? The Beinecke um, that itself has all these kind of rare pieces, kind of jewels, um, you know, connecting us with um, other writers, artists, um, you know, time periods as well. So it, it doesn't seem too, too much of a stretch. Um, but I, I don't necessarily have a, a, a good answer. I would, uh, I would say the same as, and I'm not sure if I have a very good answer for that other than I will certainly acknowledge the fact that uh, inheritance has a lot to do with our business. I mean, it has a lot to do with why I'm here doing this at all. I mean, at some point in college, I wanted to get far away from here and uh, didn't want to have anything to do with this. But then at some point I kind of realized uh, just how much was invested in and what a rare thing it was. And so I felt like I had to, you know, I couldn't just uh, walk away from this. So, so yes, the, the in inheritance of this business, um, of this legacy and trying to adapt it to modern day, that is, I guess that is something that certainly pervades what I do every day, but but I, I'll also refer to my earlier answer, which is, I don't want to just rest on the story. I also want to make sure that, you know, we have that the product um, material speaks for itself. Um, and, and just, uh, oh, oh yeah, please go I, ahead. Um, just sort of connecting what, to what Jesse said about kind of not wanting to be um, sort of continuing in, initially um, within that legacy. Um, I felt like I had a very similar response. I come from a family of educators and that was absolutely the last thing that I was ever going to be. But of course, finally, you know, I came to my senses, I'm sure my mother would say, um, and sort of came back to that. And of course, um, a lot of my work um, kind of uh, is around um, subject matter that my father researched. Um, so that, of course, there's that connection as well.
And, and so P Peter Salabras um, also put a question in the chat and I encourage everyone else to just, just add them in in the Q&A. Um, I'd love to, to hear from, uh, we, we can't see you, so it's, it's you know, impossible to call on people. Um, but, uh, but so please, please do this, this, you know, I really do welcome um, everyone's voices in this. So I hope you'll, you'll write in, into the Q&A and then we'll just, you know, uh, go from there. But um, Peter Celebras was uh, writing, uh, wrote uh, to ask, uh, particularly saying that he he would love to have a you know a recipe book from from you, Jesse. Um, but his I think the broader um, the broader issue that he touches on for both of you is just that how do you how do you think about like transmitting practice into the future, and and what um, like what do you think would be important from your practice to teach um, others who come after you and. Like how how could that even be transmitted? Since as you both touched on, like what survives mm. of this project and really of any of our work is a kind of often inert or um, an, an object that um, can't necessarily be manipulated, as you put it, Tia. Um, you know that there's a limit to how we can uh, control or affect readers in the future. And yet, both of you work as well in fields that are that require that kind of. Um, really detailed, very practical instruction in order for people to be effective. And I'm thinking particularly of letterpress as well, Tia, that it's something that um, requires a lot of um, education in order to be able, in order to be able to approach it. Um, I mean, I can start. <clears throat> I mean, I, I think kind of about the experience of trying to teach like a printmaking and book arts studio classes uh, remotely. Um, I have not taught uh, letterpress. Um, hopefully, knock on wood, I will not have to do that online. Um, but, um, you know, typically those are the kinds of courses that I would not imagine going well uh, online and really being able to, um, you know, transmit the uh, skill set. Uh, to conceptualize and I feel like I um, have had positive experiences um, with that and so I think I'm still um, kind of rolling that over and and, and sort of trying to um, sort of find what worked within uh, remote instruction that I can bring forward into my in-person teaching right um, and so in that way, thinking about practice and presence, um, you know, we, I wasn't present with several groups of students. We didn't know one another prior um, to, you know, seeing our little photo in a box on our screen. Um, you know, I feel like there was a complexity to what I, the information that and skill set I was trying to transfer to them, um, uh, including. Um, being able to critique artwork, right? Um, but I think that it went very well, right? Um, I think that there was um, an increase in dexterity, confidence that that came from that. Um, and I think that's apparent in the work that they produced, right? Um, so I'm not so sort of stuck with the lack of presence, right? Because I feel like I've had an experience like many, many, I'm sure in the audience have had of um, teaching remotely and it going okay, right? Maybe it went well, really well, maybe it just went okay, um, but it was possible, right? Um, and so still kind of thinking about futures, um, maybe it's sort of me that's sort of stuck to some extent in kind of a before um, and really needing to kind of expand um, my own imagination around what's possible and what the future could look like. Um, and I think that happens with practice as well as teaching. I feel like those two very much for me inform one another. Um, so I think this is kind of an exciting time to some extent, of course, it's extremely stressful, um, but I think there's a lot that's been happening. Um, and maybe expansions of um, self and consideration of ability and transferring um, ability as well um, that for me, I haven't quite caught up to, um, but I'm definitely open to looking for 
um, kind of lessons learned that can um, be taken forward. Um, Catherine, could you, could you repeat your initial question? Would you mind? Just want to make sure I. Oh, well, Peter, Peter really just asked what? about like documenting, right? Oh. And, and, um, and, and I think really at almost any level of sort of documenting, um, and you know, the, the process archive for this project was it, it meant to be a sort of creative space to think about how you would document either actually or, you know, fictionally, you know, how, again, it might be another space as, as Tia pointed out to, um, to make the reader think something that perhaps is or isn't true or to lead in a different direction. Mm -hmm. But then also, I think Peter was really getting at the idea of how would one document practice, mm -hmm. like in your, your practice of parchment making, Jesse, that speaks to like a lost practice almost of, of parchment making too, or barely survived practice of parchment making. Um, and so how, how would that, how should that best be documented? Um, for for other um, so that people could learn it in whatever way. Um, yeah. I, I yeah. So I'll stop there. No, that's that that's helpful. Um, so I uh, I also recently, which I, I may have mentioned to some of you in some context, but uh, there was a video that came out where uh, Business Insider magazine came to sh uh, the tannery and shot a video about parchment making. Um, you know, they approached us out of the blue. I was very grateful for the exposure, but um, that's one way of, of being able to teach or to sort of share this process with other people is, is uh, you know, through, through a medium like that. Um, and <laughs> the, you know, sort of going back to, again, to presence, um, you know, it got, it got a whole lot of views, but what I found more interesting was the um, the uh, comments that people would leave on the videos, um, you know, a, a good amount of them were, you know, way, way to go. Um, this is great what you're doing. There were, you know, some vegan trolls on there that were, you know, hoping that I die a swift death. Um, and then there were an awful lot of comments about, man, I can smell that from here. <laughs> And I thought that that was interesting because it's like, yeah, how do you, how do you, how do you show this to people? How do you get the full experience to people? And, uh, you know, I guess they did a good enough job of being able to sort of uh, translate the material and the experience and the feeling of it so that it sort of it gave people a very visceral understanding of the process. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. But, uh, but al along with that, you know, the idea of being able to share, I mean, as I said before, I've taught workshops, so that's my version or my way of being able to teach this as a material, trying to juggle that along with, um, you know, just um, producing and manufacturing. Um, and uh, invariably somebody, when they come to the workshop or someone, when they watch the video will say, wow, this is amazing what you're doing. Uh, do you have apprenticeships? And uh, we've had people um, come here before to do the occasional apprenticeship. Uh, I'm happy to have them here. Um, you know, one, one of the things that I really appreciate it is because almost everyone comes with a slightly different point of view um, about this material um, and what it is that they're hoping to learn or what they take away from it in the end. So I, I often learn just as much from them as, as they do from me. Um, so I appreciate that. And that's sort of you know, there's that accumulation of knowledge by that transfer back and forth between people, whether it is from, you know, a, a, a master to an apprentice or having workshops here and having people coming in and, uh, you know, from, from different, um, you know, different specialties and saying, wow, this is something I never saw or something I never knew, or, I mean, this, this uh, very exercise that we're doing right now is is a great way to be able to sort of help with that transfer of knowledge. So I'm I'm happy to have that. And and yeah, the um, the last thing I'll say is the uh, sort of apprenticeship, master and apprentice sort of system of doing things. You don't really see that so much anymore. But I do feel like I am sort of a um, 
you know, an adherent, accidental adherent to that, because I may have sort of gone off and done other things, but, you know, the whole inheritance coming back to this, I didn't plan on coming back to this, but I did. And I came back to it with maybe a different point of view than my father did, who didn't go to school for art. He went to school for chemistry. Um, and he came back from the Vietnam War. And so he had a very different feeling um, or a, a experience with this and with uh, his interaction with his father and how it brought him into the work that we're doing. Um, so he, his different point of view, you know, you multiply that by multiple generations and everyone brings a slightly different point of view um, into what we're doing, um, which would hold true, I suppose, for anything. But in addition to that, there's that accumulation of knowledge over time. So, you know, you can do that from one person to another over many generations, or you can get a whole lot of people together at once. And then there's this, you know, um, flurry of, of activity and, and exchange of ideas. Either way, you know, there is that, that ability to, um, to share that information and to share that process. And just um, jumping off what Jesse mentioned just around um, sort of videos and video documentation. Um, you know, that's definitely something that um, I've been thinking a lot about and probably spent way too many hours um, creating um, video documentation, kind of um, sort of showing techniques because, you know, we're not in, you know, in um, classes uh, online, we're not um, in the same studio, things like that, um, but also having students um, document their process and in process work and then and finished work as well and kind of um, trying to think of um, video documentation at least of finished artwork particularly around um, artist books as potentially an alternative ver version of the book um, uh, but also sort of giving us a more kind of tangible, more um, realistic way of approaching um, the piece. Um, I think it would be interesting to document process around this project, um, but I definitely feel like I'm not quite comfortable with that level of kind of like the window onto the process, just because I think I'm, um, a bit unsure of where of where this is going um and it feels like it's something that would, that's more for me than for kind of general consumption that's great and and i i like the idea of um of thinking about or actually documenting the process but then perhaps not sharing that like having that sort of observational eye that not as it is not transmitted to the reader and i also jesse your your response made me realize that um one thing that we should add uh, or should think about adding um is a you know a, a reader's book with the archives um in the binding key so that readers can add their comments over time as well and you can have the sense of something that is uh you know, also recording the reader's um, engagement with, with it over the future and is also not controlled in that way. And that one of the things that I find so odd about um, the archival object is that it becomes in some ways, like it stops, that's when it stops developing, except in the, um, uh, the engagement that, that readers have with it outside the reading room and their scholarship or other work. Um, and so, so uh, Vanessa Wilkie um, has a question um, and she uh, has said that you've both spoken so thoughtfully about your desire to be thoughtful creators. And she wonders if you could speak about how you think about yourselves as consumers, readers, or users of the work and materials of others. Um, and, and she, it, with this is um, asking about the way you see your relationship between what you consume and then what you create which is a really wonderful question. Thanks for asking that, Vanessa. Um, I'll start with that one, just to say on a very basic level, um, you know, one of the things that gives me satisfaction about what I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking what is often considered garbage or some sort of revolting throwaway material and, and trying to transform that into an object of beauty, um, you know, and which will in turn then be taken as a material and then fashioned into an object of art or an object of learning 
um, you know, or, or something that will hopefully, you know, be just the, the addition of multiple levels of value to that and how it has managed to carry forward a whole lot of um, amazing information and knowledge that, you know, wouldn't have existed except for somebody taking a dirty, gross goatskin and writing something very interesting on it. Um, so on a very basic level, you know, I'm a, I'm a consumer of these sort of, you know, um, of this awful and um, throwaway material um, and uh, trying to, trying to give it, um, trying to give it a second life and trying to instill it with some value and beauty. I love that. Um, I'm gonna think. I'm gonna think about that a bit more after this. That transforming something kind of disgusting uh, into something beautiful, um, and then that notion of also um, potentially something um, that's for for learning as well. Um, um, consuming others' work, I think of um, Instagram and consuming. Um, images of other people's work, or I feel like over the pandemic, so many people are sharing um, their collections as well. Um, and for me, I try to limit the intake of that, but um, because of the sort of collective social media and trying to kind of keep track of, um, you know, almost 40 uh, members and what they're doing, et cetera, I feel like I'm consuming um, imagery and video a bit more than I would. I try typically to limit that so it doesn't kind of um, creep into my own work or how I'm kind of thinking uh, um, about projects. Um, but then also thinking of, um, you know, handling work, which has been limited to almost zilch. Um, so I, I feel like at this moment, I have kind of like a, almost like a overwhelming um, overstimulation of kind of consuming um, visual information online um, and then kind of like a dearth of um, handling work and sort of thinking about work and, and researching um, work and um, particularly, um, you know, preparing for like in-person classes, I would be um, you know, visiting our special collections library, um, you know, selecting work for them to look at. Um, and I'm not able to do that because um, I can't go to the library. Um, so I feel like the last year has been um, sort of between that of um, over consuming um, on social media um, and then not really being able to consume in kind of a more um, thoughtful and maybe more appealing, at least to me, uh, way of being able to handle the work. Yeah, and I wondered if we could just like draw on that and um, and if you both could talk about how how the tactile or how just engaging with um, material practice sort of drew you into your work generally. Um, and, and if you could just speak a little bit about when you realized that um, the, the sort of the, the tactile was that important to you, um, when it's not something necessarily that comes out of, um, comes out of a, a K through 12 or BA experience, which might be focused on other applications of 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 work. So could you speak a little bit about that? Because you know, I personally I um I never went into the um you know the the small college I went to it I never once even it never occurred to me to go into the special collections that they had, right? And so it was only later that I ever even encountered um, a rare book or a manuscript. Um, and, and again the tensions around touching those, um, handling those as a student are are such that it feels in its own way quite unnatural, right? And so, so I just wondered um, about the tactile and how, how it became a formative influence for both of you. I'm happy to start. Um, so I think that, um, you know, the presence of uh, rare books, manuscripts, kind of um, historical material for me has always 
been around me. I mean, my father was a historian. Um, and for several years, I worked as an assistant for him and spent um, lots of quality time um, in, in the stacks. Um, so I think that that was always present and present in, in our home. Um, whether I was, it was front of mind or not, it's very much kind of like the background of my existence. It's sort of all around. I feel like just um, kind of looking around um, in the family's house, it's just sort of like, oh, okay, that's where that's coming from, like, of course. Um, but having um, that sort of understanding around like book arts, that wasn't necessarily present. I mean, for me, I remember um, doing research, field work, having a story to tell, knowing how to write, you know, an essay, an article, and moving in that way, and being very um, unsatisfied with it. Um, it wasn't doing what I wanted it to do. I wasn't really sure what I wanted it to do, but it was more than than that. Um, and you know, I think I had always been. Um, attracted to printmaking, um, but never really understood what that was about either, um, down to being at a artist residency, I think at McDowell, um, and pretty much hounding the printmaker who was there at the time, um, down to kind of hanging out in the studio silently, kind of observing and writing about um, the process, but really not thinking that's what I wanted to, to do in any way. Um, so I think I was always kind of dancing around it, but not really adding it up, um, but definitely um, within writing, just being sort of displeased and not quite getting there. Um, and I think over um, several different residencies where I finally had a chance to um, do some letterpress printing that it started to get closer to bookmaking, but it still kind of wasn't there. Um, but I think that sort of um, draw of sort of tactility um, and sort of the sort of presence of manuscripts and, and um, rare books, rare documents kind of has always been in my life. So kind of looking back, it, it all makes sense. It, the sort of journey there is sort of stumbling kind of around, um, but I think it, it was always there. Um, thank you, Catherine, for such a softball question, because everything that I do is all about tactility. So I feel like that was tailor made for me. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I didn't ne necessarily know a whole lot about rare books or, or manuscripts. Um, as I said before, I sort of backed into this field of study and have learned about it as I've gone along. But everything that I've done is all about the, the tactility of this. And, you know, I mean, and uh, this, this is probably true for everyone, but it, you, you, get, you get a rough piece of wood or a rough stone in your hand and you want to polish it. You want to make things smooth. And I mean, that's, that's, what, <laughs> that's what all this is about here is just making things uh, smooth and clean and making it receptive to ink. So, uh, um, you know, and, and that, uh, you know, sort of overlaps with, or I should say my art um, background um, sort of, I think has overlapped with that, um, you know, that, that interest in tactility has definitely sort of informed the, the art that I did back in school. And then that has sort of, that ended up sort of um, moving into to this field. Um, but, uh, and also I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if it weren't for um, people in the field of medieval studies. Um, because you guys, as you said, when you asked the question initially, you don't get to handle those priceless rare books or I should say very few people do. So they don't, they don't, they don't get to know what that feels like. And so that's why a lot of folks will approach me and say, I need some material, I need some samples, I need to know just how far I can push this material, literally and figuratively, um, you know, what it's capable of. So, which I'm, you know, more than happy to do. So yeah, it's all about tactility and that is where I feel like I can be of the most service to 
folks in this field is to be able to help give them material to, to handle themselves, to be able to understand it on a physical level. Yeah, okay, so, so I think we have um, time for one last question if anyone wants to write one into the Q&A. Um, and in the meantime, I'll like, since, since I'm here, <laughs> I'll ask uh, maybe my last question, which is, you know, Tia, you talk about the container and I have to say, um, I, I feel like I inserted the idea of the archival box and the containers into this project because I, I hadn't realized, although I should have done that, of course they um, kind of captured the imagination and they, as you point out, they, um, and Jill Partington did um, last week, they totally frame the, the project um, and, and the, the boundaries of it in many ways. Um, although it's just a box, right? It's just like a cardboard box. So, so I guess my question is, um, really if as you're envisioning this like surviving in the future you know with the, your future reader there in the Beinecke reading room it's been paged um, through whatever mechanism it's been cataloged you know by in in whatever way um, how what do you what what emotion do you imagine or what do you imagine engendering when your reader like opens the box yeah like what do you want that moment of of, of opening the box of this project a year, 10 years, 100 years from now to, to, to be? That's a great question. And I feel like at any other time with any other project, I would have an answer, a very clear answer. Um, and with this, I, I don't. Um, and I'm just kind of sitting on unknown. Kind of, it's bizarre because I don't, I, I usually know, right? Um, and so um, this is a, a unique experience for me not to know. Um, and my belief is that once I'm kind of with that container, I think it very quickly will, will come. Um, but I think it's partly this sort of moment in time that is so bizarre and unique and ongoing um, where it's almost hard to imagine what the future after this is going to be, um, that it's kind of hard, hard to say what, what I'm expecting for um, someone who's gone through this experience, um, who's sort of out of it to, to, um, to, to, to interact with, with that piece. So um, yeah, I, I, I would say I always have an answer <clears throat> for this because it's part of, um, my thinking and I think about like 24 seven um, on a project and with this, I, I, I don't have an, have an answer. And, and it really is my belief that once I have that container, then it, it becomes a bit realer. That's sort of my one variable that will be contained in this, in this kind of open-ended project. Right. Will they actually be able to touch the container or will it be sort of put somewhere off limits because it's too precious of a, of a project. Um, well, well, the, you know, the, the stacks overall are, you know, it, I, I think, um, you know, Tia's, Tia's a term of the jewel. It's like everything that comes into the A Special Collections is then, you know, they're aiming at posterity, whatever that looks like, right? And so, but what's curious about it, um, is that the containers of archival materials are, you know, they're cardboard boxes for the most part, right? And so they themselves are so ephemeral and so generic that it's, um, you know, they're a supply, right? And so, and, and, and so posterity is contained within this sort of cardboard supply. So I just wanted, I'm, I'm just really curious, Jesse, to hear your thoughts on how you Im imagine that um, moment being of sort of the staging or the unstaging of of your, your final outcome of this? Um, well, right, I mean, you, Tia, Tia mentioned it first and I forgot, um, and I was wondering sort of in the lead up to this session, I was like, I haven't gotten my archival materials yet. Um, I'm assuming that they're coming, but they haven't, they haven't arrived yet. But uh, yeah, I'm sure as she said, that will sort of help, help things coalesce, will give, give you something to work around. Um, and I was thinking, um, Honestly, it's like, what if I took that archival box and 
paneled it in parchment. What would that look like? Uh, I don't know if that's possible or if that's a step too far or, you know, but, uh, you know, maybe that would make it more interesting to take it off the shelf in some future library. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, whatever materials that I, I mean, every, every material has a smell. Parchment certainly has a smell. Um, so, I mean, it's, yeah, it's uh, often about the, the I mean, there's, there's, there's several aspects of it, but there's the, how it feels, the tactile nature, there is the appearance, uh, you know, the sort of uh, subtle visual uh, nature of the skin, um, and, then, uh, and then the smell. And if, I, if you do your job well, it shouldn't smell that much, but also over the course of hundreds of years, it will probably lose most of that anyway. But uh, I was thinking that if this is all kept trapped in a box, you know, that might be the first thing that uh, somebody experiences when they open that box is uh, a little bit of smell of goat or something. So. Right, yeah, I, I think Bonnie Mack was also thinking about how to transmit sort of, um, you know, smells or, or um, fluids as well. And so, and so I, I do, you know, I, I think this idea of the, the vial or the container that can't be opened because the contents would then dissipate is something that um, has, has come up to this, it's really interesting uh, sort of theme recurring through the different conversations. But so we, we only have a few minutes. So I think um, I wondered if you both could maybe just have your last thoughts of maybe like the one thing you, um, whether exasperated or, you know, whatever that you'd like to say about the project um, um, that would be the sort of one thing that you're thinking about at this moment here when it's still so inchoate, you know, you're still so much in process on thinking about what it is. And, and since we're recording, I guess it will also be to some, you know, future reader um, in some variation who's watching the, the process um, as well in this particular moment in April. Um, Um, I'm happy to start. Um, I mean, I'm for me, I'm just trying to be open. And I definitely think that the um, Chauvin trial and kind of how that's unfolding and unpacking and um, shifting kind of our understanding of um, George Floyd's murder um, it is definitely having effect on at least the writing that I'm doing um, at this point. Um, but just trying to be open and, um, you know, understanding that each day, each week, each month, each, you know, ave of um, COVID um, sort of shifts, um, you know, at least my understanding of, of being and, um, you know, the past and what I consider a future. And if we ever get out of this time, you know, what sort of after times might look like. Um, so I'm just trying to be kind of open and um, present and trying to just sort of take in um, my reaction to, to things kind of every, every day. But um, right now, I feel like that, tri that trial um, is definitely um, having some impact. I don't, I don't know exactly what impact, um, but it's definitely um, shifting the, the writing that I'm doing. So we'll see um, as the days unfold. Um, thoughts that I would go away with, I mean, I am a, I'd, I'd consider myself a, a big consumer of, of news. You know, I read, read every day, uh, try very hard to be aware of events around the world and around the country, um, you know, regarding you know, the, the issues with the, um, the Chauvin trial right now. I mean, that is certainly something that is um, present. Um, you know, I, I suppose, you know, I'm, I'll acknowledge that I certainly have privilege to be able to do what I'm doing and to be able to keep my head down and to be able to focus on my work and to be able to do it in peace. Um, so I'm, grateful for that. I realize that not everyone has that opportunity. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, for as much as everything that is going on out in the wider world right now, um, I mean, what I'm trying to do is, you know, I mean, I, I feel like uh, 
running this this business this uh this um you know this uh this shop whatever you want to call it um maker facility whatever right now it's i, f I feel like um it's a bit like riding a, a bucking bronco trying to hang on and you know do everything the right way make sure i you know i aim and hit all the marks along the way without without sort of getting thrown out of the saddle. Um, so it does feel a bit like a wild ride for many reasons, COVID being one of them, um, you know, and our, our fortunes have certainly uh, ebbed and flowed during, during, the, uh, during this last year and a half. Um, and, um, you know, I hope that we emerge intact. <laughs> um, and uh, so trying to square that and trying to also find space to take everything that, you know, all of the, the stuff that is swimming in front of me right now with uh, just, um, you know, running this business and, and trying to, you know, trying, trying to research and make new things and make better things and make better parchment and make, uh, you know, uh, new new products and do all of that scientific research that I love to do and to stretch the boundaries of this material and its applications and so on. Um, trying to sort of distill that down uh, through whatever funnel and be able to find the time to put it down on a page and and have that be some sort of coherent essay when this is done. As terrifying a concept as that is, I guess that's uh, that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to focus on. Right. Well, well, you're, you're both such generous thinkers, you know, and I, I, I am really uh, grateful that you've both taken this on in what is such a, um, like a, a period of such, um, so many different anxieties and tensions um, that it's, it's uh, difficult to think about, um, to, to focus in uh, past all the various uh, uh, ways that the present is pulling us in so many different directions. Um, to think about, as you said, Tia, you know, the aftertimes and, and what those might be and um, what we might want them to be. So, so thank you. Um, thank you so much for um, this discussion today. And I, um, I know like our audience members, I am on tenterhooks to see um, what uh, comes out of this in, uh, in June. And so, you know, more to come. Um, and thank you everyone for, for joining us as well for this today.